you may you may recall that uh, last time we went over the shape of uh, Dante's cosmos. Remember the and the point there. One of the points uh, uh, was to show that the context of Dante's experience, the way he moves, the tale he's telling about his extraordinary experience he has, is really the whole cosmos. It's not, it's not just uh, uh, one's own uh, uh, town, one's own place, and so on. It, it, really, it really takes place within the cosmos. And we saw how Dante describes that cosmos. Uh, uh, he describes it in terms of uh, a physical and the metaphysical uh, principles. As I say, he has all the materiality and the spirituality of two hemispheres all placed in one. And uh, the Empyrean is the, the threshold and the limit of the physical cosmos and the way of entering into the spiritual cosmos. Uh, the, 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 the challenge he has as a poet is that to show the relationship between the finite and the infinite, the way that they are really disjointed at the same time they are not. The finite universe can only be part of the infinite universe. And so he describes how the infinite enters the finite and the finite enters the infinite. This is the heart of uh, the cantos of metaphysics, which we, we all call, the, which we can call the cantos of physics and metaphysics at the same time. Now Dante moves straight into the Empyrean. <coughs> he was in the, uh, you remember, into the primum mobile, or the crystalline heaven. Before that, he was in the heaven of the fixed stars, 25, 26, 27. Then he moved into the, uh, the, the crystalline. Now he is uh, into the uh, Empyrean. Uh, this is the end of, uh, of, 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 of the race for him. It's the end of the journey. Uh, and the question will be uh, how he is going to say farewell to Beatrice. There'll be a change of the God. Uh, Beatrice, the role of Beatrice as a guide will stop. We'll end with Canto 30 of Paradise quite appropriately. It's suitable. She is uh, the woman tied with the number 30. She appeared in Canto 30 of Purgatorio, uh, stays on the stage of the poem for 33 cantos, and now she's going to actually disappear. He realized that she has disappeared in Canto 31. But there's a change of the God because Dante moves from Beatrice to a uh, contemplative, a historical figure uh, all, all the time, or almost all the time with Dante, um, Bernard of Clairvaux, who was a famous uh, monk, of uh, French monk, who uh, stands for, um, uh, tr he has written treatises on contemplation and mystical vision. So appropriately, he's the one who will usher and pray the Virgin Mary, that she may in turn pray her son, it's a chain of mediations, so that the beatific vision may be granted to Dante. That's going to happen with Canto 33, and we're going to find out the difficulties that Dante has in both seeing, but above all in recalling, in recollecting. The poem will end up with uh, being a sort of uh, uh, registering uh, the defeat the unavoidable refeat of memory and the importance of forgetfulness. So we're going to find in Canto 33 a sort of uh, a further twist to the metaphor of, you remember in Canto 33 of Purgatorio that I mentioned to you what was happening, Dante will go on being immersed ritually into the river Lethe and then into the river you know it. There are two rivers, one the river of forgetfulness, the one the river of memory, of good memory. And Dante goes on saying that they really came, it, the, he was at the, at the point where the, the two streams were really uh, originating from the same source. It is as if memory and forgetfulness, first of all, are equated with water there in Canto 33 of Purgatorio, implying the ability. Uh, you know, the, the water has that quality of flowing, the fluidity, the ability of both memory and forgetfulness, but the most important thing is that they originated from the same place. It is as if Dante were already preparing what, what will move now front stage in pa pa Paradiso 33, namely the notion of a forgetful memory and the importance of a forgetful memory. You have to forget 
and you have to remember. And somehow the two are going to, to be brought together. It's not a mystical proposition that he advances. It's actually the, uh, the way of justifying his poem. But we'll come to that in some detail, I hope, in, uh, uh, when we come to Canto 33. What I would uh, emphasize, though, to move now to Canto 30, Dante is entering into the uh, heavenly Jerusalem, uh, which is a garden, and it's a city. Uh, and will be described as such. Uh, you, you will see in, um, well, let's turn right uh, now to these images. Uh, uh, well, this is really Canto 30 line, a sequence of images, uh, lines, uh, uh, 32, uh, I'm sorry, 110 and following, page 437. I saw 112, line 112. I, uh, I saw um, rising above the light all around in more than a thousand tears, as many of us as have returned there above. Uh, the heavenly Jerusalem is first of all described as a theater, and we ought to really think about it for a moment, a theater. And if the lowest rank, that's the images of the theater, uh, where you have in an auditorium today, tears, uh, and closest within it so great a light, why is the expense of this rose in its, what is the expense of this rose in the farthest petals? The second image is that it's described, uh, to describe this, uh, uh, the heavenly Jerusalem is the rose, a, a white rose, a mystical rose, and I can tell you immediately, since Dante is using, using the image, that this is, uh, it derives straight out of a uh, 13th century French poem called The Romance of the Rose, uh, with which Dante had translated as a young man into a sequence of sonnets, part of his experimenting with poetic forms. But it's also, it's deeply altered, because The Romance of the Rose, which is an extraordinary satirical poem, uh, trying to a compendium of all knowledge, it really has, it's, it, it deals with, it's a story of, about nature and about uh, reason, the connections between re reason and nature, but it's also a story with a sexual um, theme. Dante is clearly taking that language of the romance of the rose and literally spiritualizing, reversing it. But uh, the resonances of the original poem are still there so that you, you, you are forced to think of, uh, of the heavenly Jerusalem as also having some kind of materiality uh, within it. You cannot just say, well, I'm taking that image, place it in a different context and hope that the original, the residues, the traces of that original image are going to be completely faced. It's part of the strategy of once again hinting, intimating that spirituality and materiality now are still going to be uh, converging here. So that's the archaeology, let's say, of this image of the rose. So uh, this continues, like next paragraph, into the yellow of the eternal rose, which expands, arises in ranks, and exhales others of praise to the sun that makes perpetual spring. Beatrice drew me as one who is silent and fain would speak, and she said, behold, how great is the assembly of the white robes. This is a procession, uh, a theatrical performance of sorts. The whole of paradise is a theatrical performance. And whenever we think of theater, uh, now, let me just reflect a little bit on this image. When we think of a theater, we understand that it implies the reduction of the world to a spectacle. That's what a theater is. The world is something to be seen. It's also an optical phenomenon or a case, to put it in another way, which really does not uh, do any violence on the, on the text, a question of the representation. The world is a representation, implying that I become the spectator. I am it's their representation for me. I can really watch this world and see it in its whole totality. Just as Dante has seen the whole of the universe, now he can see the whole of the totality of the blessed. This is the whole of the heavenly Jerusalem where all the blessed will be sitting, enjoying, acting, and spectating uh, at the same time. So two, three things that I want to say here. On the one hand, the theater is an image of multiple, perspectives, right? That's what a theater implies. You're sitting there and I'm, I'm standing here. 
uh, multiple perspectives. But Dante wants to say that he's enjoying an overall perspective, what we call a perspective of the whole. He can see the whole of reality. He sees the whole expanse of the horizon of the world. So in other words, whatever he's saying about himself, it partakes of and it belongs to the totality of the world. Um, he's not seeing something isolated or disconnected with the rest of the world. This is to him what legitimizes a claim to be a visionary poet. To be truly a visionary poet, you have to be able to see the whole of a reality, not just like Narcissus, your own image, not like someone who is bound to one's own perspective, one's own self. He sees the whole of the world. And that's really what I think is the claim or the implications of, uh, of the image of the theater. The rest, uh, I think that they need some glossing. Uh, behold, how great is the assembly of the white robes. Okay. Um, a sense of the magnitude of the spectacle. Then see our city, how great it is, its circuit. It has been described a little earlier as, uh, in terms of a rose and a garden, and now it's a city. That's an interesting shift in Dante's poem. It's an interesting shift for a number of th reasons because the whole poem now appears as literally a journey from the wilderness, not to the garden, but to a city or to a garden which is a city. It is a way of encompassing the whole movement of the poem within these two figures. This is, it is as if the whole impulse beho behind this, this experience of Dante is a reintegration into what a city implies the place where many other people are, as if I'm not only seeing the world as a whole, I want to be part of this whole. And the way of being part of this whole is this political uh, point. The city, a heavenly city to be sure, but it's, it has uh, the, 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 the idea of city always implies some, some human compact, some human uh, idea of, uh, uh, of, of uh, what we call usually the polis, the political, political reality. Let me just add something else which is interesting in terms of Dante's imagination. We have a compression of images from the pastoral tradition, the garden, and the idea of city. And we do know that when you read pastoral literature, you r really have, usually have this uh, juxtaposition, it's called between the urbs, which you know is the, uh, is the, the terms for the urban, no, the, uh, the city, uh, from the, uh, the urbs, from the rus, the rustic, uh, a division between gardens and cities. Uh, this is the economy on which pastoral literature, eclogues, bucolics, ideals, idyllic literature is usually based on, on this divergence between the two modes of Im the imagination. Uh, I live in the city and then I want to go down into the villa. I want to go down to the country. And as if there were two, a kind of, a, almost a hint of a schizophrenic existence that you have with uh, Roman and, 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 and Greek poetry. What Dante is doing is literally shattering that distance between the two modes. In an eschatological perspective, in a perspective which is at the end, city and garden come together. It is literally a change, both in the idea of the city and in the idea of the garden. They are not two divergent modes of the imagination. They really cohere within one. You see what the point is? The point is that no matter what Dante is touching with his imagination, all the oppositions, all systems of contrarieties, of contrary forms, he tries to always bring them together in a kind of concordance, discordant made concordant again, which is the idea of music, a kind of harmonization of all these, uh, these oppositions and everything that he has, we so far have been seeing. But now there is a further image which sort of complicates the problem. See our seeds so filled that few souls are now wanting there. This is a kind of line which is really strange because it's implying that uh, for all, us, all of us latecomers, 
There is no room. There's no even standing room there for us. So because the, the, the places have all been taken, almost all been taken. Very few, the implication is, are going to be saved. But then one can make this claim. It follows because he really believes that this is a kind of, uh, that he, he, he has a, 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 what we call an apocalyptic vision. That the end of the world is near. And therefore he can say only a few seats are available. Or, which is really the way I think, that, because I don't think that Dante really has an apocalyptic vision. That is to say, what I mean by an apocalyptic vision, apocalypse means visionary. He is a visionary. Apocalyptic means, implies the imminence of the ending of history. I don't think that he has that idea at all. A man who keeps thinking as he does about the renewal or the corruption of institutions, the hope that some intervention will come from other human beings or from, of history, a king, for instance, or uh, an intervention from uh, the world of grace cannot really have a sense of the imminent consummation of history. You see what I mean? You wouldn't be worried so much about renewing uh, the institutions. What is then the line that this line is to, uh, can be taken to mean, and I think has to be taken to mean, is that seen from the perspective of eternity as he is, really there are a few seats. You see what I'm saying? That if you see it in terms of uh, the totality of, of time, then they are not, uh, a lot of time has been, has, has already passed by. And then he will continue a haunting image, I think, that sort of gives all this talk of uh, this mad reflection from city, uh, whether Dante has an apocalyptic imagination or not an apocalyptic imagination, uh, look at this, uh, this absence. And in that great chair, on which the eyes are held by the crown that is already set over it, an empty seat, it's taken, a crown is on it, a king is going to be sitting. That's what I call a haunting image of royal, uh, royal absence and royal presence, because it's, you'll see in a moment what it is. Um, before thou shalt supper these nuptials shall rest the soul, which shall be imperial below of lofty Henry. This is the emperor uh, who actually died in 1313, whom Dante was hoping would come down to Italy from the Holy Roman Emperor, come down to Italy to set uh, the Italy straight, that is to say to placate the violence between the cities, the, the whole history of Italian communes, but he had died prematurely and he's expected in heaven. But you see, so there is a way in which the, the king, the emperor, is beatified, his seat in heaven is going to be assured, and yet m implying that somehow the violence in history is going to be, for the time being, continued and prolonged. So a political, uh, a political interest, a political, uh, uh, the, the, the keeping, the holding on to Dante's own uh, fantasies of political renewals that gives, therefore, the sort of the tempers or views that Dante may have, an apocalyptic imagination. The blind greed that bewitches you has made you like the infant, etc. It, uh, and then Dante goes on, uh, the other great problem, the canto ends with uh, a final denunciation about Simon Magus and the reference to Inferno 19. This is, this is Dante's at the height of the universe. He can't forget Simon Magus, can Inferno 19, and Boniface VIII. Uh, gets his dues and shall make him of Anagni go, Pope Boniface VIII, go deeper still. You remember how they were, they were punished being upside down in the ditches and uh, the flames of fire, Pentecostal flames of fire on the soles of their feet. This is the way they had been twisting around, turning around the gift of prophecy. Okay, let me just go on to Canto 31. Um, it's really a farewell to Beatrice, and I thought that we, we expected so much her arrival in Canto 30 of Purgatorio. We should see how uh, the uh, farewell uh, takes place. Uh, mm. uh, uh, and so uh, let's turn Canto 31 lines 40 and uh, following, page 449. I, who had come to the divine, from the human, this is Dante speaking for himself, to the eternal from time and from Florence, to a people just and sane, 
with what amazement must I have been filled. Truly, between that and the joy, I was content to hear nothing and to remain silent. And like a pilgrim who is refreshed in the temple of his vow, as he looks around and hopes some time to tell of it again, so, taking my way up through the living light, I carried my eyes through the ranks, now up, now down. He looks around to see who, whom he sees, and uh, he, he, he actually will go on listing the number of uh, blessed uh, women and men that he sees. Um, I carried my eyes through the ranks, now up and I down, and now looking round again. I saw faces persuasive to charity, um, used to charity, adorned with another's light and with their own smiles. So that this blessed are blessed because they are with some, some other in them. They are themselves and there is another in them too. And with their own smiles and every movement graced with dignity. Already my glance had taken in the whole general um, taking in the whole general form of paradise, what I, what I called earlier the vision of the whole, the totality that he manages to gaze at, but had not yet dwelt on any part of it. And I turned with new kindled eagerness to question my lady of things on which my mind was in suspense. We have now a um, revision, a rehashing, if you wish, of the scene of uh, Virgil's disappearance. When Beatrice is just about to come, Dante is so awe stricken by and, 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 and seized by tremor at the uh, approaching of Beatrice that he turns around to try to see and get comfort from Virgil, and Virgil had vanished. We have now a kind of variant of that same uh, vanishing act. One thing I intended and another encountered me. I thought to see Beatrice, and I saw an old man. Bernard of Clairvaux, the great enemy of uh, um, the so-called of the philosophers, but I don't want to get into that, clothed like that glorious company. His eyes and his ch cheeks were suffused with a gracious gladness, and his aspect was of such kindness as befits a tender father. And where is she? I said in haste. And he replied, to end thy longing. Beatrice sent me from my place, and if thou look up to the third circle, from the highest tier, thou shalt see her again in the throne her merits have assigned uh, her. Without answering, I lifted my eyes and saw her where she made for herself a crown reflecting from her from the eternal beams. From the highest region where it thunders no mortal eyes so far, where it lost in the depth of the sea, as was my sight there from Beatrice. But to me it made no difference, for her image came down to me undimmed by aught between. O oh, lady, here he goes on now, in whom my hope has its strength and who didst bear for my salvation to leave thy footprints in hell, of all the things that I have seen, I acknowledge the grace and the virtue to be from thy power and from thy goodness. It is thou who hast drawn me from bondage into liberty the great theme of liberty that we have been discussing, uh, especially in Purgatory. Uh, also, it's, it's sealed here in the presence of Beatrice, uh, etc. Uh, so this is, uh, and now he turns to the faithful uh, Bernard. Uh, you may remember that Canto 29 ended with uh, uh, Beatrice very worried that Dante has been expounding. Remember Canto 28, 29? There have been the exposition about angels, the exposition about creation, creation uh, as an act of God's love, um, the, the ordering and the, the new ranks of, uh, of, of angelic, the angelic choir. And then uh, Beatrice gets very upset because uh, the, the whole issue seemed to be to her a way of thinking more about the appearance of things rather than the truth of things. Remember that uh, she attacks uh, the human beings on earth. They do, they do nothing else than go after false appearances. We are swayed by false appearances. So that the question was, what does she mean that the truth is? She was saying, let's get back to 
some, let's bring, bring some kind of sense of the real back into play in all of this, some sense of the, of, of the truth value, what we are saying, back into this representation. Uh, and that was the, way, was the way Canto 29 stopped, with Beatrice suspicious of appearances. Dante now gets into Canto 30 and 31 and goes back to the question of appearances and says that to Beatrice that the appearance is exactly what, the image is exactly what he has preserved, is going to preserve of her. Two things that will have to be fo followed from this. Are you with me in all of this uh, issue? Dante is saying here in the encounter with Beatrice, uh, uh, the highest, without answer I lifted my eyes and saw her where she made of herself a crown reflecting from her the eternal beam. This is uh, the language of image and the language of reflection. What Dante is saying to Beatrice is that we are always in a world of images and that somehow the images, the image is the locus of the sacredness, but the image is also has its own fleeting quality. And the journey of Dante is to go between the images and the essences. Now he's preparing for the final leap. This is to say that Dante's journey was not a journey to Beatrice, it's going to be a journey to God. Beatrice is the stepping stone for the pilgrims uh, uh, entering the uh, experience of the beatific vision. So this is uh, what I want to, uh, to emphasize. And in fact, Canto 31 ends with, like one that comes, line uh, 113, like one that comes, perhaps from Croatia, to see our Veronica. Veronica is an allusion to one of the pious women who during the Calvary ascent of Jesus, is said to have wiped his face and the face of Jesus remained imprinted on her veil. And so that Veronica became, uh, the, it's the name of the woman, Veronica, but uh, it was sort of understood in the whole of the Middle Ages as Vera Icona. This was the kind of phony, to be sure, etymology given to the Veronica. It was uh, Dante's evoking now the pilgrims who come to, who go to Rome from Croatia to see the true image left imprinted on the veil of the Veronica. This is where Dante himself is. He is like one of those pilgrims who is still seeing the image, but wants to move beyond images, wants to go and see what lies behind it. The journey of the Divine Comedy is the journey within that interstice between images and essences. Uh, so to speak. This is uh, Veronica and where old hunger is never satisfied, but he says within himself, as long as this shone, my Lord Jesus Christ, very God, was this then your true semblance? Such was I, gazing on the living charity of him who in this world tasted by contemplation of the peace. So uh, that's how we can, we are ready to get into Canto 33. Uh, which uh, is the final canto and the final vision. Let's see how Dante carries that off. And uh, uh, let me begin with, um, with uh, uh, saying a couple of things. That uh, there are a number of dramas that will go, uh, are going to be uh, unfolding in Canto 33. The first drama is that of the pilgrim who wants to see the face of God. Wants to see the face of God, wants to preserve the wit so that he can be, come back, can be, uh, can be able to come back and re retell the story. Tell the story, write the poem as a witnessing to the vision he has had. So it's a, it's a way of thinking about the relationship between vision and language, uh, if you want to, to say it in a very general way. Uh, how are the two uh, related to each other? But the real, the other drama is how is he going to remember? Can he remember? And number four, what does he really see? These are the, the number of, uh, of problems uh, that he faces. The poem begins with, the, the Canto 33 begins with a prayer. A prayer to the Virgin, uh, Virgin Mary or the Virgin Mother. Uh, and it's, it's going to be uh, constructed through a series of paradoxes, as you can see. Virgin, mother, 
uh, paradoxes, daughter of your son. Paradoxes about time, paradoxes about all sorts of reversals of the natural order, uh, lowly and exalted more than any cre creature. A way of, of using paradoxes that challenge the rational understanding of the world. This is not going to be a rational representation of, uh, of what Dante will see. Fixed goal of the eternal counsel. You are she who did so ennoble human nature that its maker did not disdain to be made its making. In your womb, you know, Dante goes on now to that motif of birth with which we began uh, talking from Inferno one, when we discussed Virgil, this idea of uh, the, the, the beginning, the idea of a beginning, a birth as an image of beginning and an image of uh, um, nature becoming an event, the idea of nature becoming a historical event, a possibility of a his historical event. Na um, in thy womb was rekindled the love by whose warmth this flower, the flower, this flower really means the whole of the mystical rose, that he has just seen. So the mystical rose begins in, uh, it's contained in the womb of Mary, uh, has bloomed thus in the eternal peace. Um, it's um, another way of, uh, of, of making this, uh, this idea of, I could gloss this uh, image of the womb as uh, in terms of this is a, the immense sphere of the mystic, you know, within which, you know, the immense sphere within which, uh, uh, the finite uh, and the infinite come together and meet. The immense sphere, uh, it's a circle, the immense sphere whose, whose, whose center is nowhere, uh, or whose center is everywhere, whose circumference is, uh, is nowhere. That's the way that he's understanding, he's explaining uh, uh, this motif of the, the, the incarnation. And what is crucial about this image, I believe, is first of all the humanization of the divine cannot, this is clearly uh, the divine that becomes divine because it enters history and experiences all that the human beings experience. The other th element that I think that Dante is uh, pushing forth is the feminization of the divine in the sense that here uh, the divine has become the child of a woman and the woman is therefore part uh, subsume this part of this divine, a kind of feminine, uh, I don't call it feminist, as I don't really know what that is, but the feminine, and I don't mean it as, uh, in, 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 uh, it's, it's a true statement, I don't know, uh, but it's a feminine, a theology of a feminine element in God. Uh, so here thou art to the Monday torch of charity, and below among mortals thou art a living spring of hope. And then the second uh, stylistic theme here is the repetition, uh, the iterative mode. Thou, lady, here, skip a few lines, and thy loving kindness, in thee is mercy, in thee pity, in thee great bounty, in thee is joined all goodness there in any creature. What is the point of this iterativeness of uh, uh, the style of uh, repetitions, of anaphoric style? I think one of the reasons, you may think of others, but one of the reasons is a language that is falling upon itself as a way of giving consistency to itself. The, the poem at this, time, at this point is really le uh, dealing with uh, vanishing traces, uh, uh, things that cannot quite be pinpointed or placed within logical propositions. And therefore, the language becomes incantatory, as if it were. An effort to create a kind of uh, a mood, a sort of a creating a reality through this, uh, uh, this mood and those, through these iterations. And then the prayer of Bernard continues. This man, meaning the pilgrim, line uh, 30, 20. This man who from the nethermost pit of the universe to here has seen one by one the lives of the spirits now begs of thee by thy grace for such power that with his eyes he may rise still higher towards the last salvation. And I, this is extraordinary, we are in a paradise and so far, not to stray so far from the temptations of mystical writing, which ends up always evoking identities, unrepresent unrepresentable identities. Dante distinguishes very carefully to till the end between I 
and he, uh, there are individualities in this paradise of Dante's imagination. And I, this is Bernard, who never burned for my own vision more than I do for his, see the differences, I and him, uh, offer to thee all my prayers and pray that they come not short, that by thy prayers that will disperse for him every cloud of his mortality so that supreme joy may be disclosed to him. That's the first prayer to the Virgin. This I pray to thee, Queen, who canst that what thou will, that thou keep his affections pure after so great a vision. So the first danger to the pilgrim is that he may be losing literally his mind. Uh, the vision of God may efface, may obliterate his powers of the, this vision, may obliterate the powers and the affections. Let that guardianship control his human impulses. See Beatrice and so many of the blessed who clasp their hands for my prayer. This is an extraordinary vision. The whole of the cosmos is praying for the, beauty, the pilgrim's beatific uh, visions. The eyes by God beloved and revered. And I, this is, who was drawing near to the end of all desires. I, am, I want to emphasize this, even this language of desire. Up to now, the poem has been, can be called literally, we have been calling it so many things. Poem of hope, a poem of peace. It's a poem of exile. A poem of desire, a, a poem of longing. And the prayer is the mode of this longing. Prayer, you, you, you address someone you don't see, hoping that you can be heard, and that, that your prayer can be answered. There's a desire for a response. This is really the mode of Dante's theology. Uh, uh, at the heart of his theological universe, there is a sense of constant longing and the sense of being uh, not quite where he wants to be. Um, and that who was drawing near to the end of all desires, I emphasize and I prepare you in case I would not uh, make a point about that, very soon the language of Dante will change from desire to enjoyment. He starts getting the sense of uh, the sweetness and this idea of uh, the fullness of uh, of his, 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 his pleasures, uh, his desire will shift into, into joy very soon. Uh, ended before the ardor of my craving. Bernard signed to me with a smile to look upward, but already of myself I was doing what he wished. For my sight, becoming pure, was entering more and more through the beam of the lofty light, which in itself is true. And now, the first defeat, Dante, starts recording um, the forgetfulness of the, this experience. From that moment, first of all, my vision was greater than our speech, which fails at such a sight. How are you going to make a failure become a success? How, from the, the fact that he is not going to be able to see, will become somehow a mode of his own, not just a humility, because it would be a success in terms of the pilgrim's own humility, but in terms of the writing of the poem. Now, the, the poem will be, the, the, it will be a different way of understanding the poem. It's not just going to be a representation of a plenitude of vision, but till the end, the statement of a longing for a vision that may come. And the memory too fails as such excess. Excess in Italian is really the language, I don't know, the, probably the English is best, etymologically it's the same thing, but in, in Italian it's the outrage. Uh, outrage in the sense in which uh, uh, with, with, with resonance that there is something uh, uh, too bold, so, uh, an over, a kind of hyperbolic, an overreaching. Oh, is that's really what it is, uh, an excess, uh, an overreaching. Like him that sees in a dream, and after the dream the passion wrought by it remains, and the rest returns not to his mind, such am I. For my vision, almost holy, almost, almost holy fades. And still there drops within my heart the sweetness that was born from it. That's all he's going to be left with. The sweetness that gathers in the chamber of the heart. This has been a journey of the heart. It is because, it exa as I've been saying uh, to you in a number of ways in the, in the past few weeks, is that the, the, the journey to God is a journey of the mind, but it's a journey of the heart. You have to, you will come to know God through this idea of the heart. But also, you know that Dante is really punning on the notion of what memory is. Because to him, memory is connected also with the heart. 
how, what can I remember? What can I record within me? Uh, what is this? this uh, 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 and the only thing that memory can, can, can uh, retrieve is this sweetness of the heart. Such a, uh, and then he continues, thus the snow loses its imprint in the sun. The image of the liquefaction of shapes, the loss of shapes, um, water that had been crystallized just dissolves, and then an image which brings us back to uh, the Aeneid, the third book of the Aeneid, thus in the wind on the light leaves the Sibyl's oracle was lost. This is the idea when, uh, when Aeneas goes to the Sibyl's cave to find out about the future, his future, and as the Sibyl opens the gates, the wind comes and, uh, and, and, and uh, will go on scattering all the leaves kept within it. And so it's the impossibility of reading, the impossibility of deciphering uh, the actual leaves, that sort of uh, messiness and confusion. That's exactly the this, this state of mind in which he seems to find himself. All light supreme, Dante now shifts to another mode on his own, and I've got a sequence of prayers, O Light Supreme, they are so far exalted above um, mortal conceiving, grant to my mind again a little of what thou pierced, and give my tongue. This is, this is the kind of, uh, the prayer of, uh, this is the prayer of uh, uh, that a language may, uh, I'm missing a page here, so, um, uh, this is the, the prayer that somehow language now uh, may triumph over him, over, over the threats of forgetfulness. Forgetfulness threatens him. Why am I uh, insisting so much that it may leave but a gleam of the glory to the people yet to come? Uh, what Dante is saying is that his poem is meant for the future, that in effect he's envisioning a future. This is not a poem written for him. It's not a poem, a poem written for his contemporaries. It's a positing of a future. That is to say, the opening up to, and that's what work will do. A work of art invents and prepares a future. So more than an act of remembrance and the commemoration, the poem will be what we call, it. I hope it's a prolepsis, a proleptic move, a movement forward into the future. But why do I talk so much about memory then? That seems to be uh, becoming now utopian. Uh, lend me some of your glory. Let me see your glory so that a spark of it uh, may be left in my text so that the future will understand it and will see and some fire can come from that spark. But why this then language, this insistence on memory? Because, that's the answer, he talks about retrieving the memory of what he has seen because the actual constitution of his poem, he can only write his poem, he can only have some authority for his voice if he remembers what he has seen. In order to ground the poem in the, no, the notion, into the, the vision of God, that therefore will authorize him to say all the things he has been saying about the living, and the, the living and the dead, the powerful and the not so powerful, the historical figures and the cultural figures of the past, it's crucial for him to remember. So that memory becomes the actual foundation of his representation. He has to bring it back, make, give it a presence to what has gone uh, on in his, his experience. You see what I mean? So he's forced to go on remembering and yet he cannot. How is he going to? Where does his authority come from then? If he can't remember, and he says that he can remember very little, only the sweetness that he's been gathering in, the, in his heart, where does it come from? And this is the, the third, fourth challenge of the poem. I think, he continues, from the keenness I endured of the living, a ray that I should have been dazzled if my eyes had been turned from it. And I remember, that for this cause I was the boldest to sustain it until I reached with my gaze the infinite goodness. Once again, uh, breaking the narrative and turning into the meditative, a prayer, sort of begging that the, the divine may reveal itself and remain within him, all abounding grace by which I dared to fix my look on the eternal light so long that I spent all my sight upon it. In its depth, 
that's what he sees. I saw that it contained the cosmos as a book. That's it, the whole world, I called it last time, a cosmo book. The cosmos is a book. As to say, as, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a parchment, maybe, but he uses also the image of uh, a book which is different from a volume. The volume is rolled up, the book is the one which we have a kind of uh, square uh, structure. Uh, the two together uh, as a kind of allegory wrapped up. So uh, I think I saw uh, in its depth, I saw that it contained bound by love in one volume. And that was the word Dante had used for Virgil at the beginning of the poem, huh? a way to give continuity to his, his quest and his questions. It begins with uh, the volume of Virgil's book and that the Virgil's book became a, becomes a prefiguration of uh, the book of the cosmos uh, that he sees bound together. That which is scattered in leaves through the universe, substances and accidents and their relations, as it were fused together in such a way that what I tell of it is a simple light. I think I saw the universal form of this complex, of this compound, because in telling of it, I feel my joy expand. Now it's the retrieval of, uh, or rather the, the, the recovery of this, uh, this, this state of mind, which is one of joy, which, does, which excludes absence. Desire has to be replaced by joy because desire always entails an absence. We long for what we do not have, at least at that moment, right? Desire is always tied to an experience of lacking. Joy is, a tied, is tied to an experience of plenitude, of a possession somehow at this point. And now another mythological figure that I want to focus on. Um, a single moment makes for me deeper oblivion. You see now the uh, the dialectics between memory that fails and oblivion that sets memory and efforts at remembering and the reality of forgetfulness. This is the, um, the, 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 the dialectic between the two metaphors together. Uh, a single moment makes for me deeper oblivion than five, um, I don't have time, uh, a single moment makes me deeper oblivion than five and twenty centuries upon the enterprise that made Neptune wonder at the shadow of the Argo. What an extraordinary image, right? A single moment. It's clearly an image to say that I, I forgot more uh, in one second. So time doesn't exist here. Uh, it exists in Dante. Dante is still being human. He's still time. You know? Time is at least he can only, his life can only be measured by time. But is in the presence of the eternal instant. But a single instant, he says, literally, I'm just glossing this, a single instance made me forget more than what we have forgotten in 25 centuries from the experience of the Argo, allusion to the Argonauts, another mythological counter to Dante's own journey. They went for the Jason, went for the Golden Fleece, Dante's going for the beatific vision. Another, another little connection, the Canto one of Paradiso starts with a, a reference to the story of the Argonauts, uh, the daring of the Argonauts, and now Dante is closing the circle here once again. But there's a further something else, that in the story of the Argonauts, as Dante retrieves it, is that the god is now below, Neptune is in the depth, and uh, Dante is now thinking of the divine as being also caught in its own unreachable, unfathomable depth, which is a height. But you see, there are two different perspectives. More importantly, here Dante sees Neptune wandering at the daring of man. Just as Neptune is wandering at the daring of the Argonauts, the implication is that he too has had this kind of daring that the divine, the god, may be wandering at his, uh, his own achievement. What is crucial is the change of perspective from the depth, depth of uh, underneath the sea to the depth um, up, in, uh, up in the sky, up in the heavens for uh, Dante's uh, God. And then he continues, that's my mind. Mind. Dante is so careful 
I wish we had time about this to show you. I mean, I know that there are some graduate students who may want to uh, think about this whole issue, how Dante, uh, Dante's lexicon about mind, uh, intellect, reason is so carefully calibrated and differentiated. Mind is the faculty of visionariness. It's, it's, uh, it's, also the, the, it's also the root word of measure, as you know, Latin etymologies, the, the medieval, medieval minds are, are always taken with the discovery of the root words. It's men's, the word men, me, measure, uh, comes from the immense, for instance, comes from the word for mind. It is as if he's still keeping a sense of the measure for himself. He's still aware of his own particular state. He's not lost in the immensity of what's around him. And thus my mind all rapt was gazing, fixed, still and intent, and ever enkindled with gazing. And that light would become such that it's impossible for him ever to consent that he should turn from it to another side. For the good which is the object of the will is all gathered in it, and apart from it is defective, that which, which, which there is perfect. Now language fails, memory fails. The second failure is that of speech. Now my speech will come more short even of what I remember than an infant. And you know that the word infant which you usually think, take to be um, a child. It literally means a child who cannot speak. You refer, you use the word infant for someone who is pre, uh, as it were, babbling even, right? That's the infant, really. So uh, far in Latin means to speak. An infant who yet bathes his tongue at the breast. Not that the living light at which I gaze had more than a single aspect, for it is ever the same as it was before, but my sight gaining strength as I looked, the one's whole appearance, I mean, I, I myself changing, was for me transformed. In the profound and clear ground of the lofty light appeared to me, that's the vision that he has, three circles of three colors and the, the, same, tr the same extent, and the one seemed reflected by the other as rainbow by rainbow, and the third seemed fire breathed forth equally from the one and the other. Oh, how scant is speech and how feeble to my conception. It ends with an unavoidable statement of failure. A failure of memory, so that the memory can be forgetful memory, and the failure of speech, unable to contain the plenitude of what he sees. Vision exceeds language, exceeds uh, speech. There is more to the text, Dante is saying, there's more to my experience of the world than what I can say in words. So there is m not everything is reducible or containable within the, uh, uh, the syllable of, of, uh, of, our, of our language. And this too, what I saw is that it's enough to call it little. O oh, light eternal, once again. Uh, the alone abides in thyself, a divine that is now caught within itself, and this is self-contained. Look at this. In thyself alone knowest thyself, and known to thyself, and knowing lovest and smiles on thyself. This is the kind of inner enclosure or circularity of the divine. In Italian, I have to read to you in Italian, so you see line 123, um, O luce, line 25 maybe, O luce eterna che sola in te sidi, sola ti intendi, only you understand yourself, e da te intelletta, e intendendo te ami e arridi. You see how the words keep repeating and falling on themselves to convey the idea of the self-enclosed nature now. There is there's there's something that always escapes. Huh? a grasp and escapes Dante's grasp. There's some, uh, uh, for all of the diffusiveness of God into the creation, there is an element of the divine that literally is absolutely self-transcendent, just transcends itself uh, completely. That circling which thus begotten appeared in thee as reflected light when my eyes dwelt on it for a time, seemed to me within it and its own color painted with our likeness. That's all he sees. He sees our own 
as he calls it, our effigy, line 131, nostra effigy, our likeness. He didn't say my likeness. It's a poem, therefore, that at the end seems to want to retrieve the, com the commonality of the common likeness that we have. What he sees is the incarnation, the human image within God. Because in God, there is also the human, since we are, if you agree with the principle that we are uh, creations of God uh, and that we were created in his image, so therefore there's something human also within the divine. And then he continues, like the geometer who sets all his mind to the squaring of the circle, a famous mathematical third in the Middle Ages, meaning one of the impossible one of the impossible paradoxes of how do you square the circle and the geometers would go on reflecting on it and that's what Dante, where Dante places himself. The, the, the uh, science of measurement that uh, uh, stumbles against this paradox like the geometer and fails, like the geometer who sets all his mind to the squaring of the circle and for all his thinking does not discover the principle he needs, such was I at a strange sight. I wish to see how the image was fitted to the circle and how it has its place there. But my own wings, the flight of the soul, the wings of the soul, right? The wings of the soul, you know, the platonic idea that we go on developing wings in order to, eros, um, allows us to, pre to uh, unfold our wings for the sight. So, and it's also a pun, I think, on uh, uh, on Dante's own uh, name, we have been talking about that. Were not sufficient for that, had not my mind been smitten by flash, wherein came its wish. Here, power failed the high fantasy. Um, how many fantasies are there? There are three, the highest form of the imagination. That's what he means, that the, a, a, a pretty romantic distinction. I mean, Coleridge between imagination and, and fantasy. Dante uh, follows, uh, Dante uh, belongs in that same line of thinking, of, but now my desire and will, like a wheel that spins with even motion, were revolved by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. And that's the end of the poem. Uh, which ends exactly the way uh, with Dante doing two things. One, seeing the prime mover and understanding the prime mover, not the way he did at the beginning of Paradiso One, but love. It was not the, 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 the definition of God as the prime mover, you remember, seemed to have a limitation for Dante, it was the prime mover moves the universe and somehow then detaches, disengages himself from it. Now Dante sees that prime move, the motion, as a motion of love. The universe is a universe of love, but holds the world together and prevents it from falling apart is exactly this power. Prevents it from chaos, it's this power called love. So the whole of the universe is in motion. Love that moves the sun and the other stars. And the only thing stable, the only thing that makes it cohere is, uh, is this love. But using the same language here yeah, of love uh, that moves the sun and the other stars. Okay, it's a universe of love, we understand that. Dante uses the, symmetrically, the same, the same phrase, the stars, moves the sun and the other stars, in Inferno, at the end of Inferno, at the end of Purgatory. Fair, we remember that. And then now I was, I, I was uh, cleansed enough to come back and look at the stars, the end of Purgatorio. And then now Virgil and I, finally managed to come back and see the stars. Now Dante says, uh, this l the love that moves the sun and the other stars. What he's really doing is placing himself immediately with this line right back on earth. He's here with us looking up at the stars. It's the line that shifts, allows him to shift from the moment of this vision that he has, a vision that is the vision of, uh, of the incarnation at the end, that is to say his own our own likeness, that's all he sees, that's all he remembers, and then comes back to earth. But it also means that this line places Dante exactly in Inferno One. And this is the story of the poem. The story of the poem, we have been reading the poem as an account of an experience of a pilgrim who goes from the dark wood in Inferno One to the beatific vision, whatever he remembers of it, and then comes back to tell us about it. What in effect we are also discovering 
in this reading of the poem is that by the end of the poem, Dante says, now my journey starts. The real journey was this poem here. So we are, in a sense, by that last line, caught in the circle of Dante's telling, in the drama of Dante's story. We read the poem, which is a kind of journey for us, then now we reread because we want to tell our own story. And then we want to go on rereading it uh, once again. Do you see what I mean? It's a sort of, uh, uh, if you wish, uh, uh, witty even, uh, uh, way for Dante to say, this poem will hold you. Uh, and it's meant to hold you, and I wish it holds you. Uh, so you can see the poem is both a journey and the telling of the journey endlessly, like the movement of the sun and the other stars. So this is the end of the poem. Now, what? let me say, I'm sure that there are uh, questions. I raised some issues. We have a minute, few minutes, and uh, I'll tell you then later what we're going to do next time. So... Uh, Please. Okay, uh, the question is uh, uh, in reference to lines 52, line 52 of Paradiso 33, uh, where uh, uh, Dante says, And I, uh, who was drawing near to the end of all desires, okay, that we understand, uh, indeed perforce, ended perforce the ardor of my craving. Okay, now that's it. Bernard signed to me with a smile to look upward. But already of myself I was doing what he wished. That's, I think, fairly, at least literally clear. For my sight, becoming pure, uh, that it's also clear, the uh, Dante's uh, experience in the final poems uh, can be reduced to a refinement of, uh, and, and, and of, of the faculty of vision. Uh, physical, but the, the also clearly spiritual. Um, was it? Uh, was becoming pure, was uh, entering more and more through the beam of the lofty light, which in itself is true. Meaning that uh, I think this means, this is also a, a, a f the footnote of yours, it's the, the footnote is to the famous phrase, in thy light we see the light. Um, the, the, uh, the idea that you, you're quite right, that it's not a light that reveals an object being, uh, being a true object. That's really what you, you, the point that you are making. That's absolutely true, I would agree with that. But it's really a statement about the light which in itself is, uh, contains a light. You see, it's this kind of, uh, that's the meaning of the, the, the biblical phrase, in thy light we see the light. It's not because of your light I see the world, I see myself or whatever. Uh, you know, in the light I see the light, the light is, uh, it's the light of truth, that's what he's saying. It's the light of truth in and of itself. The light of truth, yeah. It's a light in itself. Uh, but that was your point, or not? <coughs> With a function of light uh, here. Um, well, the I can, I can give you a, uh, a, a little bit of uh, uh, the idea of what we call the, the metaphysics of light in, uh, in, uh, in Paradiso. Uh, Dante begins with the idea that uh, what we know of the divine is, uh, is light, okay? A light that uh, the power of which 
on a sense, of, and, the, and the limitation of which is exactly like the dark, uh, in the sense that the light reveals to us the divine, but at the same time hides the origin of the light. You cannot see through the light. Okay? That's really the understanding of uh, Dante in Paradiso I, saying the glory of him who all th moves all things. The glory is an image really means light. The light of uh, him who moves all things is what I, I really saw. Now Dante is saying the origin of that, that light. Uh, that which has remained forever invisible, exactly the way the dark. You may say that you know, some of our imagination uh, is that we are in the dark. We don't know the origins of anything. We don't know the causes that lie beyond uh, our perceptions, right? Um, but we don't know the origin of the dark. We may even go like mystics believing that the dark is the image, is the cover for light. You know, well, if there is a dark, there must be a light somewhere else. In fact, that dark may occasionally be removed. The worst thing about the mystical language of the divine in terms of light is that the light itself, which makes all things visible, remains in and of itself impenetrable in its origin to the human eye. Now Dante sees it. That's the idea of the true light. In thy light we see the light. Okay? Is that a little? The beatific vision then is not, not as This is not a beatific vision. He has seen a moment of light and the origin of the light. That's still not God. But the beatific, the, ol the, the only thing that he remembers of the beatific vision is some, he doesn't say, some sweetness that has gathered in his heart. And what he then sees beyond the general form, he says a number of things. The general form of the cosmos, which is this conjunction of circle and square, uh, book and volume, you know, if you want to visualize it in terms of, and I, I like that image because it really implies the word. Yeah, that's, that's the, it's the theology of the word that seems to come out of that. Then the other thing that he sees is our likeness, i.e. he sends us back to Genesis 1, or as the creation of man in, as told in Genesis. Uh, let us make, let us make uh, uh, man in our image and likeness. So this is our likeness. But you are talking now about the light, and the meaning about this light is that the light, what does it mean to say that the light is true? Not because it reveals and dissipates the shadows, that would be one way, one function of the light. We like the light, the light of the mind, the light of the sun, whatever, because of that, the artificial light. But there is a way in which Dante is now thinking about what, I, what is called metaphysics of light. What is the light in and of itself? And the light, and Dante, by the way, if you really want to know this, Dante distinguishes between the word for light and the word for lamp, lume, luce, and so on, light, and lamp, and so on, and a number of uh, uh, scientific distinctions. But here he's talking about the vision of the origin of light. In thy light we see the light. That's the meaning of uh, the phrase.